Jurassic Time has long been the home of John Parker Hammond's audio memoir, crafted meticulously from files almost forgotten. Since then, I have taken the original goal of rescuing Richard Attenborough's lost performance to another level. I realized there were many other aspects of Jurassic Park's history, both in concept and in the people behind them, that also deserve the same level of resurrection. So far, I have conducted several interviews with people involved in the franchise's history, featuring recollections and works of art that would otherwise remain dormant. They all form their own memoirs, capturing what it was like to be part of filmmaking history. These are the tales you will likely not find anywhere else on the classic 1993 film and beyond. Jurassic Park had many creative geniuses working on the adaptation of Michael Crichton's fantastic novel as early as mid-1990, months before it was even published. One of the many fantastic collaborators was John Gurchie. He is primarily known for his unique and detailed recreations of prehistoric life, delivering works of art for museums, National Geographic, postage stamps, his own books and collective works, and of course, the film we are here to discuss today. In this special video presentation, you will witness incredible works of art that haven't been seen in years. They depict a creepier and darker vision for what the film could have been. At certain moments, there will be additional works of art from other sources visually credited. They all form the larger narrative you are about to experience. The following interview was conducted over the telephone, and the sonic quality will vary throughout. However, if you visit Jurassic Times website, you will find a transcription of the entire program for your convenience. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy this exclusive memoir. As John Hammond would say, Spare no expense. Thank you for joining me, Mr. Gurchy. Oh, thank you. What was it about prehistoric life that captured your imagination in the first place, leading to a lifelong ambition and career? Oh, boy, that's it's a little bit of a tough one because it goes back so far that I almost have no memories of the time when it first arose. I'll, what I can tell you that about what I remember is that when I was a little boy, supposedly when I was four, according to my parents, I found a mouse skeleton under the bushes in the front yard. Uh, I was fascinated by it. I think it was the intricate detail that fascinated me. Later, after that, I grew up in a suburb of Kansas City, so there were fossils everywhere. And later than that mouse skeleton incident, I found a fossil. It was a very tiny one, and it was a little, very small brachiopod. It was about, I don't know, maybe four millimeters wide. And again, it was something about the intricate detail that fascinated me. And I won't go off on a total tangent about this, but I think those two incidents are the aesthetic side of things that attracted me in both of those cases. I think there was an aesthetic dimension to my, my little four-year-old self being fascinated with those details. <laughs> and I would argue, and I'm just going to say one sentence about this, but I would argue that there's an aesthetic component to the work of a lot of adult scientists. Definitely. Usually some kind of moment from childhood that triggers lifelong aspirations, right? Right. Definitely. But for me, it was visual. It was, it was always visual. Yeah, was that considered your aha moment that turned your passion into a career? Well, no, because I didn't know anything about paleo art. Of course, when you like something as a kid, you draw it. So I started doing that right away, of course. But no, if I had an aha moment, I think it was much later. It actually happened during my first watching of the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah, me too. And, and I was, I was uh, 16, I guess I was 17 at that point. I just finished my senior year in high school, and I was with my girlfriend at the drive-in. 
uh, you know, I was thinking about the usual things you think of at the drive-in, but <laughs> when I saw what was going on on screen, it, I forgot about all that, and I moved the car right up front so I could see what was going on, and I couldn't believe my eyes, and it really sort of enlarged my perspective. I'm ashamed to admit, a little embarrassed to admit how much influence that had on me. You know, I'd like to say I had many varied and sophisticated influences, but really, really that movie was what kicked the football down the field for me. I won't say too much about it because I could go on for hours about this, but, but basically just, I think it got across the idea of what a large gap there is between something like an ape and something like a human being. And it sort of takes you that distance in the one jump cut from the <laughs> yeah. the bone that's spinning in the air to the satellite that's orbiting Earth. And you realize that the satellite is a direct descendant of the bone. And that kind of thought had never occurred to me before. And I began to see humans as really a spectacular development in the history of life on Earth. That took me down the human path. I had a lifelong fascination with prehistoric life, but I, the human side of things, I didn't really get that part until really that moment. Yeah, I can see how it led to your other works, such as your amazing recreations of prehistoric man. I could definitely see how an incredible movie like 2001 A Space Odyssey would inspire you. Jurassic Park fans like myself definitely share that quality with you. I guess you could say Jurassic Park was our 2001 A Space Odyssey, if you will. Lots of people became paleontologists and other careers thanks to that film as well. So, yes, we definitely can understand that connection. Sometimes people don't realize how influential films can be. How do you best capture the essence of a prehistoric creature and setting that you wish to create? Oh boy, the <laughs> essence of it. Hmm. It, I guess it depends on what I think the essence of it is. If it's a dinosaur, I try not to go overboard with trying to give them character, you know? Although some of them sometimes have a smidgen of that. I really try to stick with the biology and I uh, try to ask myself, what would it be like to be standing next to this scene and watching this unfold? But when I worked for Jurassic Park, I worked on the Tyrannosaurus segment first, and I thought they just wanted anatomy and range of motion and that sort of thing, body proportions. For the second segment, the Velociraptor segment that I worked on, they wanted more of a character. Well, I did one drawing of a, a Velociraptor, that is very evil looking. And it took some very subtle tweaks of soft tissue around the eyes and so forth to get that look. And it wasn't very difficult for me because I'd always pictured velociraptors as these uh, nasty, smelly chickens with switchblades. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't too far from that to depict them with a hint of evil. Oh, definitely. Like the way they are portrayed in the novel. They're pretty villainous creatures in Crichton's book, for sure. Well, they are sort of in a biological way. I mean, the movies took it a step further because they tried to give them an evil look, which really is kind of silly. We're just as humans imposing our sort of frivolous ideas on these actual biological creatures <laughs> uh, 90 million years after the fact. I mean, it's kind of silly in a way, but... I think that the book is pretty good about depicting them as very cunning, sort of, and, you know, they're smart and they are definitely predators. But the superimposition of a little evil on that, it, it's kind of a silly touch, but if it makes it more possible, more doable in a movie, then so be it. Kind of like when the raptor's lip curls in the kitchen scene right before it attacks the kids. I always questioned the accuracy of that moment. Yeah. Now, the Tyrannosaurus Rex in the film had two distinctive structures in its head from the nose to the top of the eyes, resembling a distinctive brow. The raptors had a similar structure. A lot of paleo art incorporated that look after the film. Was this your idea, or did it come from elsewhere? No, I don't think it was my idea. I may have heightened it a little bit. When you look at a Tyrannosaurus skull, it has these sort of uh, rugose bumps in that area, you know, it's all above the eye. It starts just in front of the eye and it's over the eye. And so my interpretation of that was that there were some bigger scales there. But I don't think I was the originator of that idea. I think other people had done that before me. I'm not sure who. But maybe it will be reinterpreted in some other way in the future, you know. Yeah, paleontology constantly evolves, of course. 
So you've read the novel. What were your thoughts on it? My thoughts on it weren't 100% positive, to, to tell you. <laughs> um, I, I loved the dinosaurs, of course, and I loved the fast pace of the plot, but the humans were somewhat disappointing because I think Michael Crichton, for some reason, he has a problem with writing characters with any depth to them. Uh, so the humans, to me, were sort of like cardboard cutouts, really. Yeah, I've read a lot of his novels, and the characters were usually his weakest points. The science, of course, he always nailed, but the characters were actually an aspect of the film that certainly improved in comparison. They're a, a bit more invested in the story. I think that's right, and I think the characters in the movie are good, and they have good and understandable motivations and that sort of thing. Did you have any input for the human characters of the film? I didn't have input into the human characters. I had some input into the plot ideas because they were still kind of, you know, cobbling this thing together in 1990 when I was working. I saw a number of things, a number of ideas of mine die on the set um, <laughs> because they, cause they didn't work out the way they wanted them to. There's a scene where there's a velociraptor or two that, that are stalking the humans and there's a scene where it, there's a hanging sheet of polyethylene, and one of them sticks its snout under the bottom of it and lifts it up and comes through. Well, that had an evolution, and that's one of my ideas that I saw die on the set was a, was a precursor to that. So I made a drawing for them of a velociraptor on the outside of the visitor center, and the power is out, and it's dark. It's putting its hands on the, the glass of the window in the door, and it's also kind of foggy and steamy. And now that evolved into several things, but one of the things it evolved into was having the same sort of thing, but having the velociraptor be on the other side of a sheet of polyethylene, and then its claws rip through the polyethylene and shred it, and then it comes through. In one model, they had little razors inserted into the claws so it could do that. But it just wasn't working when it was filmed. It was just not coming off the way they wanted it to. So they ended up just nosing under the thing instead of ripping it. So that's one little, little example of, of a thing. Here's another thing that, that I had some input to. I was accidentally responsible for the least scientific anatomical <laughs> detail of the dinosaurs. And here's the way it, it happened. Rick Carter called me. I think it was a Friday afternoon. And he said, okay, I'm working on a plot segment here, and I'm wondering how to resolve this. Let's say some people are backed into a corner by one of these carnivorous dinosaurs. I think he mentioned specifically the Dilophosaurus, became the spitters. He has these humans backed into a corner, and then the paleontologist Grant, by virtue of something he knows as paleontologist that the others don't get, he somehow gets them out of that situation. And so I said, okay, what if there are predatory dinosaurs, maybe Dilophosaurs, that have some inflatable structure? And I was actually thinking of an inflatable balloon on the nose or snout area, but I said some inflatable structure. And let's say we've seen two of these facing off, two males, let's say, and one of them inflates the, the structure and the other one is intimidated and runs away. Okay, so then fast forward to the humans back into the corner by the same critter. Let's say this inflatable something or other is red and black striped. This dinosaur has backed them into a corner and Grant sees a red and black striped umbrella in the corner and grabs it, opens it, and it scares the dinosaur off at least enough for them to get away. So I thought that was a great sort of Spielbergian touch. But by the time I got out there to watch some of the filming, that part of the plot had been cast aside, but the anatomy was still there. The Tylophosaur had this thing that looked a little bit like a um, opening umbrella, the frill around its neck. So, so that's just a little tale of how that detail got in there and how the anatomy it out survived that plot element. Yeah, I was definitely curious about that detail. I had read about your involvement in that elsewhere, but had wanted to know more. Believe it or not, last year I'd won a collection of storyboards in a binder from a Phil Tippett Jurassic Park auction online. One of the storyboarded sets featured a version of the sequence you just described. So I'll have to show that to you. 
Yeah, I've never seen it. Well, I will definitely show it to you. Well, yeah, I'd like to see it anyway. Oh, definitely. I love stuff like that. The story developments and how they changed and evolved as the film went into production. Those are probably my favorite details. I loved your idea of the spitter umbrella, by the way. I thought it was really cool and amusing, even. In the storyboards, it is done a little differently, but very similar. The kids use it instead of Grant. Such a clever idea and fantastic that it came from you. Regardless of the scene being omitted, I am kind of shocked they never made an actual real spitter umbrella that people could really buy. It seemed like kind of a missed opportunity for a product. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That would have that would have been a million seller. <laughs> oh, totally. By the way, have you seen the first Jurassic World film? They're doing a sequel to it right now. Yeah, I did see that. Number it's movie number four, right? Yeah, there's a scene where I thought they may have been inspired by your idea, where they are exiting the Innovation Center at the film's climax and use a hologram of a spitter to distract a raptor. It just seemed very similar. Apparently it's just a coincidence, but I feel like perhaps someone saw something of yours and got inspired. But that's just me. You mentioned the illustration of the Velociraptor against the window, and that was honestly my favorite one that you recently revealed. It was really eerie. It's spooky. And, you know, there are a lot of spooky drawings that I did for the Velociraptor segment. And part of the input for that was it was October when I was working on it. And Halloween was approaching. So it's a great spooky time of year. And the setting I was working in, I had an office at the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum. And I right outside the office was a, a part of the Smithsonian collections called The Range. And it's a bunch of fossil collections with cabinets that extend almost to infinity, et cetera. And they turn the lights out after a certain hour, maybe it's six or something. And I was often staying there past that time. So I had this really spooky atmosphere just outside my door. And some of those drawings that you see that I've released are taken directly from that part of the Smithsonian, from the range. You know, there's one where you see evidence that a skeleton has been tipped over and broken, and, you know, it's an indication that something has gotten in. It was very easy to do kind of spooky drawings in that setting. Yeah, I wish the other Jurassic Park films had more atmospheric settings with dinosaurs and minimalist ways like you depicted. More in silhouette instead of always detailed looks at them. That's why that particular image really captured me. I love it. Back to the Dilophosaurus spitter for one more moment. Do you happen to know why it was made smaller in the film than its fossils suggest? Or was it simply a young adult or cloned to be that small? No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they could have obviously chosen a larger one and gotten away with it. But maybe they thought, I don't know. I don't know what their thinking was. Maybe they thought that they should vary the sizes. You have the largest in the Tyrannosaurus, of course. And then you have human-sized velociraptors, which were actually Deinonychus. And then then maybe they thought, okay, we need a little one too. I don't don't know. But I've never heard anybody talk about that. That's just one of those old questions fans are still trying to figure out. Why did they do that? I'm sure you know this detail, but the size of the raptors actually was an issue during the film because they were making these human-sized velociraptors and... The real Deinonychus and the real Velociraptor in Asia were quite a bit smaller than that. And so, I don't know who it was, but somebody challenged them on this. And something like a week or two weeks after they started filming that segment, Utah Raptor was discovered. So, you know, we knew that we had something along that line that was even larger than than the ones they were depicting. So I think they felt a little safer after that happened. I remember that was an issue at the time, so it's great that the film ended up being accurate after all with that aspect. Did you work on any other dinosaurs beyond Tyrannosaurus rex, Velociraptor, or Dilophosaurus? Really, I only worked on Tyrannosaurus and the Velociraptors. I didn't even work on the anatomy or anything else relating to the Dilophosaur, except for that plot element that just kind of came off the top of my head that day. Was there a collaboration between you and paleontologist Jack Horner on the film? Did he make any suggestions? Well, I've collaborated with him on other projects, but I didn't very much on that project. 
so I can't tell you anything that he suggests specifically about that movie. One of the other striking images you did was of a velociraptor bursting through a library bookshelf. What was your inspiration for that illustration, and did you come up with a complete sequence? I really didn't take it much further than that, but I've always felt that libraries are a little bit spooky places, especially in the dark, uh, because you can hear if there's somebody one aisle over or two aisles over, you can hear them, and you may even see them a little bit, but it's incomplete. So it's kind of a spooky setting, I think, and I just wanted to take advantage of that. There's another drawing. I don't think I posted it, but it's of a velociraptor eye on the other side of a shelf full of books, you know, just peeking through the cracks. That was kind of the thing that chronologically came before the bursting through scene. Ah, that's so cool. Were there any other plot segments you created that went in and out of scripts? Was there any you had wished remained? To make this more real to me, when I first got the assignment, I started keeping a diary as Grant. Oh, wow. And I fleshed out the story sort of in my own way, never never in- intending for them to do the same. It just was a way of making it more real to me. I record when I first got a vision of the velociraptors and stuff like that. The scene of the velociraptor bursting through the library sort of became a scene in the kitchen. You know, there's there's one scene where a velociraptor pokes its head through the under part of a, I don't know what it is, a rack or something, but it pokes its head through knocking pots this way and that. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, definitely. So every idea gets kind of reworked and changed a little bit, and that's okay with me. Yeah, it seems like Jurassic Park went through quite a pre-production. I've been looking at a lot of different versions of scripts. Ideas would constantly bounce around from one draft to the next, going in and out repeatedly. I'm sure many films go through the same thing, but it just felt like this one had more time spent on playing with ideas. So you've read the novel. Now, did you work directly with Michael Crichton? No, I didn't. I didn't work personally with him at all. No, I never even spoke to him. You know, I talked with Steven Spielberg, and I talked with Rick Carter a lot. He was kind of my main contact, and some other people that were filming. And I went out there and got to meet everybody, and that was a lot of fun. But no, I never worked with Michael Crichton. You know, when they posted the Jurassic Park poster that I painted, when I went out to watch a little of the filming, they had to ask me to do a plan for the poster, and so I took a pencil drawing of that same plan. Spielberg liked it a lot, but there was some debate about whether they wanted to use that or something else. So I was waiting, but it was getting near time when I'd have to be finished. So I started it even before I knew that it was going to be chosen or not. And Spielberg called me up one Friday and said that he was calling to give me the go-ahead, the green light to paint it. And I was really happy about it. But I had had a lot of work to do, and the deadline was coming up very soon. So I worked all weekend on it. And by Monday, the marketing department had gotten a hold of it, and they wanted you know, something that was a, like a simple logo, and people already recognized that image on the front of the Jurassic Park book. So they chose that instead. I thought, if I get a photo of this finished poster in front of Spielberg, then he'll choose it, maybe. And <laughs> and so I really tried hard to do that. So, But he's surrounded by a circle of guard dogs whose job it is to not let you get to him. So I could, <laughs> I could never call him back. That was a heartbreaking thing at the time. I can imagine. That poster is incredibly detailed and amazing. What's amusing to me is that they had people spend so much time on creating posters for the film, like John Alvin, who did a number of them, only to just end up using the logo set against nothing but black. (laughs) But, well, there it is. Now, you said you went to visit the set and got to witness one of your ideas fade away, essentially. But what did you see at the set, and how often were you able to visit? Oh, well, I only went out for one session. I was out there a few days, and so it wasn't a great long time. But it was fascinating to me to watch how things were done, and not only the complicated things and not only the dinosaur scenes. Other stuff was very interesting, too. And, well, for example, Jeff Goldblum and Dr. Grant are talking in the car that's supposed to be going along a track, and it's nighttime. And I think it's the scene where Jeff Goldblum says... I'm always on the lookout for the next ex-Mrs. Malcolm. So that scene, the way they actually filmed it, uh, was to have these two actors sit in the car, and 
they had a giant, slow rotating sort of turntable like Gizmo, and they had these poles coming out from it that eventually resulted in a rope that was like a circle, sort of, or an octagon maybe, out along the perimeter. I don't know, 15 feet from the center of this rotating gizmo. And they hung these plant fronds on the rope with clothespins. And it was the most ridiculous looking thing. I thought, this is not going to look right. <laughs> and so they didn't even try to make hang the foliage in realistic ways. They just sort of hung it up. They had it spin so the plants would go by the window. And then meanwhile, the way they had the car sort of suggest that it was on a moving track was that they had a cinder block and a two by four and a guy standing in front of the car leveraging the bumper and moving it a little bit up and down. You know, so there's just sort of realistic looking motion to the car. And when you watch this scene, you totally buy it. You're focused on the actors, you're not noticing the mostly underexposed anyway, plants going by or you just you buy it. And I was amazed that something so stupid looking could work. That's actually pretty amazing. I don't think I'll ever look at that scene the same way again. (laughs) Sometimes when we watch a movie, we don't realize that even seemingly simple scenes have special onset effects, like the one you witnessed. That's pretty cool you were there to see that. Yeah, yeah. And I got to see some of the dinosaur stuff too, and that that was fun. I'm sure this is common knowledge now, but they did the dinosaurs in a few different ways, uh, including a guy in a suit. But the, in movies before that, when you had a guy in a suit, it never looked very good. Uh, it look, ended up looking a little like Godzilla or something. But this one had the right proportions and the right bends and various joints in the leg, and the, the actor had to sort of fit into all that with this. It looked like, to me, it would be very uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> so that was that was one of the things. But they also had robots like a front half of a a Velociraptor robot for close-ups. And it had uh, 64 bicycle cables springing out of the back of it that they could control this thing so they could make its arms move and its jaw and its head tilt and all that stuff. And when I was looking at it, somebody came up to the control panel and it made it bite me. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like they definitely had fun on that set. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then I got to see the the Tyrannosaur model, it was, I didn't see any filming of that segment, but it was in a big warehouse, and for some reason the power was out, and so I had to go in there and stand next to it in pretty much in the dark. But it was kind of fun to see it under those circumstances. It was a little bit scary. Oh, definitely. That's why I hope the filmmakers are sticking to their promise of having more animatronics in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Nothing can beat having something really there. Stan Winston created amazing animatronics for the first film, especially. And I am sure they looked even better in person. Yeah, yeah, they were good. So, since it was brought up before, what did you think of Jurassic World? I didn't like it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And the reason I didn't like it was because, you know, part of the plot is people are no longer experiencing a great amount of wonder at seeing live dinosaurs anymore. So they had to sort of up the attraction by genetically engineering something fiercer, larger, etc. Well, I think that was the philosophy also of the movie makers. They were saying, we got to really, we got to have motorcycles running through the woods with velociraptors and just a bunch of ridiculous stuff like that. There's a lot of excessive stuff in there that, that just smacks of an attitude that People have lost their fascination with seeing these creatures, and we got to do something to really wow them. So, you know, the, the scene where the pteranodon that it grabs and picks up, it, <laughs> she not only has, has to be carried away, just be dunked a few times in the water, and doesn't a mosasaur come up and snatch her? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I just thought, oh, yeah. Oh, brother. Jumping the shark or jumping the mosasaur, right? <laughs> Yeah. So to me, that movie had a lack of wonder to it, which is really a strong component of the first movie. And it was like an action movie with dinosaurs, and not very intelligent or very, not really much of anything except a lot of action. So I didn't, I didn't like it too much. Those are definitely valid points that a lot of people, I'm sure, would agree with. I even do to an extent, but I still enjoyed the film for what it was. 
I went into it knowing full and well it wasn't going to be Jurassic Park, that it was its own thing. And it definitely was. So I definitely understand the points you made. What did you think of the original film after you saw it, and how did it compare with your original vision of it? It compared pretty well, because I think I was just in love with the idea of seeing totally realistic dinosaurs on screen for the first time. As a kid, I followed all the Harry Harryhausen animations and all that kind of stuff, and I even came to think of dinosaurs moving with this sort of semi-jerky movement <laughs> of a stop-motion animation. When I was a kid, that was my picture of how dinosaurs must have really moved, of course. But um, but I was in love with seeing all that unfold on screen and done so realistically. I, I just, I like it. I can't claim to be unbiased about it, having worked on it. The whole thing was kind of a starry-eyed experience for me. You know, if they'd made a crappy movie out of it, what I've noticed, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, the original film is anything but a bad movie. Do you have any materials that you saved from the production of Jurassic Park? Somewhere I have one of the Velociraptor's teeth. They made zillions of them, obviously, and so they gave me one. I think I also have a claw, a Velociraptor killing claw, that was made for the robots. And then I have a little chunk uh, as kind of a souvenir. There's a scene where the humans jump from a balcony to land on a a dinosaur skeleton that's hung from cables in the visitor center. And eventually they fall to the floor and, you know, lots of chunks of plaster fall down in bone and so so forth. On the set, there was a mess of all this stuff coming down. And I saved a little bit of the debris. I gave some of it to, there's a paleontologist at the Smithsonian for Christmas one year. (laughs) Do they know that you took it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I probably not. I, you know, and it doesn't look like anything. It looks like something I could have just gotten by walking in the woods and picking up a piece of bark or something. That's amazing. Have you ever been offered to work on any other film since then? And would you, if you had the chance? Oh yeah, I would. I I like doing that. And in fact, I'm helping with one right now that's in progress, and I can't say too much about it. But it's a movie about a woman who is building a reconstruction of Lucy, the Australopithecine, for a museum. And as she works, it's kind of about the connections that she forges with this ancient personality. It's a fascinating movie to work on. And so far, all I'm doing is providing material for them, a lot of reconstruction details and stuff like that. But I'm hoping that I get to have a little more to do with it. I've made suggestions for plot details for that one, too, so we'll see how that comes out. They're looking for funding for it right now, and so I have my fingers crossed. I think it's going to be called The Reconstruction. That's really cool. I had no idea about that, and it sounds like it's going to be really interesting. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on that. Are there any current or future projects you are working on? There's a documentary that's being made. It's somebody in the U.K., it's about human evolution, and those folks have approached me. That was only last week, so I'm not exactly sure what they want of me. I've offered to do a lot of stuff and laid out kind of a smorgasbord of things to choose from, but I don't know what my involvement will actually be in that case. I'm spending most of my time finishing up a book project. I have a book coming out in early 2019 called Lost Anatomies, and artists have explored the human form for centuries. And human origins science has extended that field by revealing the precursors of the human form and how it came to be in the first place. So it's an artistic exploration. It's like a visual celebration of the evolving human form. It's a big art book. So that's what I'm spending most of my time on these days. I'll have to get a copy of your book for sure when it comes out. I really love your style. I remember growing up as a kid during the time Jurassic Park came out, and I remember seeing your work in magazines. In fact, I think there was an, even an issue of Boy's Life that had your art on the cover. That's right. It left such an impression on me. And you did a couple of covers for National Geographic, right? Yeah, that's right. I've, I've done four now, two of more dinosaur issues. Yeah, like the Myasaura and the Brachiosaur herd, right? That's right. I love those so much. They've both been ingrained in my mind since childhood. The one that was the Brachiosaur heard, that project had a charmed life. I had been knocking on National Geographic's 
door for about close to 10 years. And I've done a lot of work for a whole lot of other people, including the Smithsonian. And National Geographic was kind of my hardest nut to crack. So the senior art editor, Howard Payne, called me and said, okay, we've got an idea. We'd like to talk with you. And could you come in on such and such a day and so forth? So I went in to talk to him. And they said, okay, we're doing this issue on extinction. And we want to feature a dinosaur in this poster that's going to be tucked into the magazine. So I had had this idea, basically the idea behind what you see in that piece of art. I'd had that for a long time. And it had been sort of bugging me and like knocking on the back of my brain to paint it, you know. And so I described it. And he said, it sounds interesting. Draw it. I drew it. And with no changes, he said, it's fabulous. Paint it. So I painted it, and they sent me out to talk with a couple of paleontologists in the West about both Brachiosaurus and Allosaurus. So I turned in the painting, and then about, I don't know how many weeks later, they called me to say it had been chosen for the cover, which I didn't even know was in the running for that. And then a couple months after that, it won a gold medal at the Society of Illustrators in New York, and so I thought, after my first project with National Geographic, I thought, wow, working for National Geographic is really easy and fun. Now we're on 12 issues, and the other 11 were never as easy and sometimes very <laughs> hard. <laughs> but, I mean, I, they all had elements of fun because I loved designing and, and executing the art, but sometimes there was some heartbreak along the way. That first one in particular, that's so great you were able to do everything exactly how you wanted. Like you said, it doesn't always happen that way. Well, I have one final question for you. What is your favorite dinosaur, and why? Oh, okay. <laughs> I like the weirder dinosaurs, so I'm really taken with oviraptors, and I also like therizinosaurs. They express almost a creative spirit. When I look at the array of sizes and shapes of, of critters alive, let's say in the Cretaceous, it seems like such a creative time. It seems like nature had a wildly creative spirit in those days. So the weirder looking dinosaurs kind of express that well in an image. So I guess those are my favorites. Those are definitely good choices. I know a lot of people have grown to love the uniqueness of their Xenosaurus. Yep, yeah. Well, thank you, John, for taking the time with me today to answer these questions. Yeah, well, thank you. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed this special look back in Jurassic Park history. John Gertie had quite a vision for the original film, and despite many of his fantastic ideas being put aside, they snowballed into many details that remained. Of course, John has been quite busy since working on that film, so why not follow him to see what he is up to? Check him out on Instagram, Facebook, and his website, www.gurchie.com. That's www.gurchie.com. I would like to thank him for his time, and thank you for watching. There are always more stories on the making of this incredible franchise just waiting to be found. As John Hammond would say, In a darkened room in an empty building with a dirty floor, it waits. The flashpoint, the origin of Jurassic Park. Be sure to return to Jurassic Time for more. Visit the Facebook page for the latest updates or check out the website at jurassictime.trustcom.org. This has been Derek Davis. I hope you enjoyed this program.